Um, the next workshop, the speakers would like to have more like interactive um, with the um, people like I, I really need down there. To so if else. you're willing to gathering come to the front, we yeah. will be pleased. If you can come to the middle, I think that would be fantastic. Because I didn't have like in a <laughs> wide angle. <laughs> uh, uh, d d who do I send the link to? Sorry, maybe, I, I like forgot to be my. You install the signal on your computer. On your uh, yes, device. I do signal. Yes. Yeah, so you, maybe you can just send me the link. Yeah. Yeah. Unless you will buy it, it will not work out. So maybe you can just start it and yeah. I will like. Yeah. Okay, so while we set up, can I just have a bit of an idea like who's in the room? Like um, anyone working on misinformation, information control, censorship, anything like that? Anyone? Yeah? Yeah? yeah. Do you want to share like, like what, what are you working on in terms of online misinformation, information control? Okay. Hey, thank you. Uh, so my name is Johnson, and I'm working. I, I'm the founder of uh, Cofax Project in Taiwan, which is a uh, crowdsourced fact-checking chatbot platform. Yeah. Wonderful. Yes. Cofax is like one of my kind of like my my uh, model for for what I'm working on. Um, so basically, what uh, what I want to what I want to do in this session is to have a bit of. I want to invite people to come and. Um, help me build this prototype. So I have a working prototype, and I want to share a little bit like the journey of building this prototype. Um, so the initial idea was to build a, a chatbot, in, basically just a chatbot that interacts with people um, and see whether wh whatever they're sharing on WhatsApp is is um, misinformation. But then I realized that after like, looking at what Kofax are doing, what the, the similar uh, chatbot doing in, in, in oh, Thailand as well, what other groups doing in oh, Indonesia, oh, different, different groups, what the IFCN um, um, network are doing, I realized that perhaps for Malaysia, we need to kind of take a step back and think about how do we do, um, how do we do, ooh, Okay, the fonts There's just got off. It's okay. It's fine. Piece. Yeah. Yep. So, so the, so how do we do this in Malaysia, right? So, um, I've tweaked the title a bit. So this is more of a sharing of learnings, and then maybe towards the end we can look at you know, um, what ideas you might have that you can suggest or recommendations. Um, maybe a little bit about myself first before we start. So my name is Kyril. I work in human rights for the past 11 years, 10 years, um, on and off. I also worked in finance, in, uh, in fintech, in the media, uh, at Engage Media. So I, I work with a human rights collective called Engage Media, a very regional, regional outfit, um, in mainly working in Southeast Asia and South Asia. Um, so my work mainly revolves around localizing digital security resources for human rights offenders. Um, researching uh, uh, online censorship in, in the region, and also now I'm, I'm looking at you know, how we can reclaim um, human rights tech, what I call human rights tech, uh, privacy respecting, um, open and secure technology um, for human rights offenders. Um, and I want to plug a little bit about JPEG 24. So if you have heard about Engage Media, you probably have heard about JPEG 23, the regional convening that we had in Chiang Mai last year. So this year we're bringing JPEG to Taipei in August in conjunction with EPRIGF. So we are opening the session proposals today. I think it's already up there. So do check out the website JPEG.net and we hope to see you at JPEG as well. Um, right. So. So what I've, I've divided the kind of the, 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 the session today into like four parts. So I want to take you through a bit of a media landscape in Malaysia and a little bit about the laws around misinformation and also um, who are the different you know, actors working in the space. 
and then maybe I want to look at you know some of the terms that, that we often use around misinformation, some of the preconceptions that we have. Let's see if you have, um, if you agree or disagree. Let's have a bit of a debate on that, um, and then I want to introduce to you the system or the tool that I'm I'm working on called Funnel Loop. Um, so. Like I mentioned earlier, so initially it was, it, was, it was meant to be a chatbot and then I realized that the chatbot doesn't have anything to feed on. So we need to build an inf uh, a, a information management system first before we can build a chatbot. So that is kind of like where the, the prototype is at now. And then at the end, we can you know, spend a bit of time, play around with it and then see um, what, what, we can, what I can do, what you can help with. Um, and I have specific requests for ideas, recommendations, and suggestions. So if you have something, you know, that come to mind, just just shout or just you know, or note it down somewhere that I can look at later. Um, so about the media landscape in Malaysia. So for the longest time, the media entities in Malaysia has been owned have been owned by um, political parties. So all the big uh, conglomerates, media conglomerates, are owned by um, the ruling party. So the way that the the media business uh, media businesses were sustained mainly from businesses from government. So you know there's there's a basically a loop of um, government you know influencing certain business decisions that they have to buy ads in certain uh, media entities that link to them, and then these media entities would support you know government agenda slash propaganda. Um, but that dominance kind of gone down, I think, like uh, the past 10 years or so, like because of the change of government and also because of the, um, there, there are more and more kind of smaller, more independent uh, media, pro media organizations out there. So these political linked media companies, although they're still out there, but they're not as dominant as before. Um, and then language. So unlike Taiwan, Malaysia is not a monolingual country. It's very plural, very multicultural. And that is also reflected in our education system, in our media, in our uh, you know, commerce, all sorts, right? All, all aspects of life. Um, so the media often, in the past at least, you know, different media media properties would be catering to certain uh, uh, segment by language. But now we're seeing a bit more of a convergence where you know you have one media property that have you know that have different different versions of the same um, website. So take for example, Malaysia Kini, like one of the kind of the the, the top notch independent media in Malaysia. They their main, their core uh, newsroom report in English, but you also have like very established Chinese um, desk, they have established Malay language desk that kind of run independent of the English ones. And, and they're all part of the same um, media entity, they work within the same newsroom. Um, and then the same kind of model has been replicated in kind of uh, the, the, the tech reporting media, like you know, those uh, websites that review games or gadgets or you know, kind of the, the tech telecommunications media uh, industry. Um, so they, they basically have come up with a model for, 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 these, me for these independent media um, properties to be able to reach the number of impressions that the old media had they need to be able to kind of cast a widest net, right? Um, there's also been changing in practice. So I think this is quite similar everywhere around the world. So in the past, um, it's always been that, you know, they would broadcast first and then whatever that they broadcast um, on the television, they post it online. Or whatever they print in the paper and then they post it online later. But this has turned around already like the past 10, 20 years, I think. Um, where everything now go online first, and you know we have newspapers that kind of gone down in readership so much that they've turned from dailies into weeklies, um, or even just go out of business. Um, so that is kind of a reflection of 
um, internet usage in Malaysia as well that has, you know, I, th I think that has increased so much that it, 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 uh, it surpassed the rest of Southeast Asia. Um, another, changing, another change in trend also, I think, in readership and viewership. So when I talk to people who work in the, um, in the media industry, especially people who, who sell ads, people who talk to you know, kind of other businesses, um, to, to basically, you know, the, the people who take care of the business model, they are saying that um, these metrics are not very relevant anymore, right? So the number of impression that you have today worth a lot less compared to like, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. And that I think is also a global trend and you probably can recognize it elsewhere. Um, what is next? So in terms of fact-checking, there are kind of what I've laid out is kind of the main ones that are kind of doing at a, at, in, a more, in a more coordinated way within their own um, organization. So germ check and fact-check at the top, those are like um, civil society-led groups. So germ, germ check is more of a, uh, more of a, a co coalition or an alliance of different different actors within the media space. Fact check is like a its own um, social enterprise that solely focus on fact checking, and they have um, a sustainable business model to to sustain their um, their non profit work as well. Malaysia Kini is an independent media that came out of um, the late nineties kind of political change. Um, and it has kind of gone through different different uh, evolution. So from being you know free online uh, English only uh, online newspaper to now they you know solely subscription based. Um, they do videos. They do um, different kind of medias. They have other media properties as well that kind of run you know together around Malaysia Kini. Um, AFP, um, so AFP has a very good global network of um, um, uh, journalists, uh, bureaus. So in Malaysia, they have dedicated persons, I think, not, not, pe not, a, lot, not a big team, I think like two people working in Malaysia solely on fact-checking. So they are, they, they are, their job is more integrated with the global um, AFP fact-check team. And then there are all these other kind of big media companies like Astro and The Star. Uh, My Check is basically a project of the National News Agency, kind of like um, our AFP or, or AP in Malaysia, but they're, they're, they're state-owned. So they have their own um, fact-checking uh, project. And Sabernarnia is a basically govern propaganda. So it's, it's a basically a website run by the uh, Multimedia Commission of Malaysia, multi MCMC, Malaysian Commission for Multimedia and Communications. Yeah. So they, basically the, the, the Sabinaranya, the, the, their goal is basically to kind of correct the, the whatever, whatever untruths that people spread about the government. Um, but I think like I, I put them kind of, I rank them this way in terms of kind of how relevant they are to me and, and I think to like most people in Malaysia. Um, from talking to each of them, I realized one thing that they all have their own channels of um, receiving tips from, from their readers, from their viewers. Uh, they have, you know, WhatsApp channels, they have, you know, like an online form, they have uh, what else? They have email service that people can tip, send tips about you know something that people want to fact check. But then, when I talk to them, oh, do you talk to people at Malaysia Kini? They also report on the same thing. Do you talk to people at AFP? They also reported on um, this particular scandal that, that that blew up the other day. Um, apparently not. Like there's no kind of cross uh, organization sharing at all. Um, even within the Jom Chat, which is like an, a group of different different people, 
it's still very siloed. It's, it's still led by just Joan Czech people. Um, so a lot of the collaborations is kind of like in name only. There's no real way to tie the different fact-checking efforts together. And that's when I started realizing, okay, there's no like central database that I, I could feed into for, for the chatbot that I'm, I'm thinking of. So then the challenge would be to really start thinking about how do we build a system that can tie in the different, different efforts together. Um, yeah, so we have a lot of laws when it comes to misinformation. Uh, it's, it's quite, it's quite uh, insane, I feel, sometimes, because, uh, for example, our Communications and Multimedia Act, for example, has this one provision in Section 233 that is so vague to the point that like you don't even you don't even you can't even define it enough uh, because it would just say any communication that is obscene, indecent, false, menacing, offensive, with the intent to annoy, abuse, threaten, harass. So when we go to court and challenge this, a lot of the time the the, the sticking point would be, how do you define these things? How do you define intent to annoy, or abuse, or threaten, or harass? How do you quantify it, right? Um, and then this, this criminal defamation, like most um, former British colonies, we have we've inherited this in our penal code. Um, so we have criminal defamation on top of the civil uh, defamation law that we have. So the problem with criminal defamation, of late, um, it has been used to basically silent dissent. Um, a lot of the times, you know, there's, a, there's threat like, okay. So one example I can give was around this whole issue with um, the, the, the war in Gaza, right? So McDonald's, a lot of um, American um, brands were in Malaysia, owned by Malaysians or other, other countries. They were targeted with uh, BDS movement. And then these corporations would try to use um, criminal defamation against these people. They, they, go, they push the police to basically you know, press charges instead of taking them through the civil route and actually you know, take, a, take a civil action. They actually you know, try to get the government to uh, use the penal code, the criminal, the criminal law on um, people. So it, it often abused in such a way that the the power dynamics is so off that it, it tend to, you know, side with the, 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 the big companies or the big corporations or the government or people in power, basically. Um, we had anti-fake news law, uh, tortured term, uh, fake news, so when at the height of the 1MDB scandal, the big financial um, scandal in Malaysia, the government actually passed an anti-fake fake news act. And then shortly after that, the, the prime minister lost the election and there was a change in government. The new government abolished it. But then uh, COVID happened and then we had an emergency um, proclaimed in Malaysia. And because of the emergency, parliament was suspended and the government sneaked the um, anti-fake news law into the emergency ordinance. Basically, their, their rationale was, we need this law because there's a lot of misinformation around COVID, which was, yeah, true, but the, the kind of, the kind of um, response that the government took was really, really disproportionate. And they justified saying that, oh, because we have this emergency ordinance, the, the number of uh, misinformation has gone down. But again, how do you quantify that, right? How do you quantify the before and after? It's, it's practically impossible. Um, and it's now revoked because the emergency ordinance revoked. Uh, so we don't have that uh, abhorrent law anymore. Um, the other kind of weird thing in Malaysia also, we have this issue with intermediary liability. So this one, it was, I can't remember exactly when it was 
amend it to include this, this particular section where if there's an online content and it was published anonymously, the publisher of that content is presumed to be the author. So think, for example, if you're a Facebook and then you have someone posting something that is you know, against the law on Facebook and that person is anonymous, cannot be identified, then it's presumed Facebook is the author of that comment. So just on that basis alone, it, alone, it just kind of run against you know, basic principles of natural justice or human rights, all sorts, right? Um, it hasn't been tested until recently when there was a contempt of court case where there was a comment on Malaysia Kini website that basically called you know, the, the judges, called call names, called the, the judges in one of the high profile cases uh, bad names. So then instead of you know, investigating it or even just drop it because it really didn't affect the case, the court basically held um, Malaysia Kini in contempt and they were found guilty and they had to pay the fine. Um, so that is basically the precedent now. And like uh, the human rights community, we're constantly trying to see how can we kind of go back and challenge this law again. Um, because the way it came about also is quite sneaky. Like it wasn't, it wasn't done through, you know, consultation with the civil society. Often when you want to kind of change, you know, laws that to do with the uh, criminal procedure, there's always consultation with the, the, the bar council, the, the, the legal fraternity, with the human rights community. But this was done with, um, was done quite hastily. hastily. Um, so, yeah, so maybe we can have a bit of a debate about this. Like, if you have any disagreement about any of, like, you know, of these things that I, I want to share, uh, please speak up. Uh, maybe you can have a bit of a back and forth. So, often when we talk about misinformation, I think we always think that misinformation is the exception rather than the norm, right? But if you look at it, misinformation happens all the time, right? Like, it's not, it's not strange to have misinformation around us. Uh, it happens everywhere. It happens, you know, it probably is happening right now. Like, I'm probably, you know, giving you misinformation right now. I don't know. Um, and also, we sometimes think that, you know, misinformation is not natural, right? Like, the, the, the state of human, the, the, the fault of human is to always tell the truth. When that's not true, right? We, are, we, we have evolved as storytellers, as a species. We embellish, we tell stories, we, you know, add things, you know, we, we take things away from, from our stories. Uh, and if you, look at, if you look at history, throughout history, you can trace that, you know, there are different versions of history. And it doesn't mean that, you know, there's 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 one single truth, right? So so, I'm, what I'm trying to say is, we often treat misinformation as something that is not uh, no, normal or something that is not natural, right? And in economics, for example, we always talk about the natural uh, rate of unemployment, for example. I think there is a natural rate of misinformation. That is, there's a threshold that that this is the normal acceptable level of misinformation within the society. Of course, it's going to be hard to quantify it, like how it's hard, kind of hard to quantify unemployment, but that, there, that, there needs to be a general acceptance that, okay, this, this level of misinformation in a society is probably acceptable. Um, we also sometimes treat misinformation like it's new, like, uh, like it never happened before, only in, in this information age that we have misinformation, when it's not true, right? Like at the, the, the beginning of the printing presses, misinformation already started, right? And that's where, you know, the journalism ethics came from. Like, you know, when, when people see, okay, it's so easy to, to start your newspaper and spread rumors about other people, about um, companies, about 
government about uh, organizations then you know there needs to be ethics there needs to be um, a standards for verification a standards for uh, 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 fact checking a standards for you know quotation so so standards come from that you know chaos and often people think about misinformation just online when in fact we deal with information more i argue offline right we probably go to the um the, the tea shop you know someone was probably spreading this information out there just talking um and it's not always intentional so my my point with this is to link back with the law before a lot of the times when when regulators come to you know try to address misinformation they would put so much weight on the intent of you know spreading lies or rumors or misinformation right when a lot of times people just repeating what they heard without the intent of you know spreading lies or mis misinformed other people um and probably the last one probably a bit of a maybe you probably don't agree i think it's not that big of a deal perhaps um it's not that i'm saying misinformation is not important it's not something that we have to address um uh, what i'm what i'm pushing back against is more of the knee jerk reaction when we talk about misinformation we talk about censorship as a way to address it when we talk about misinformation we we'll talk about all these laws that would you know prevent people from just expressing themselves so perhaps like you know in in some countries that have kind of strong um uh, freedom of freedom of expression and free speech culture like like in the US or probably um, some countries in Europe that's that's not that's not the kind of the frame that we're working from but for a country like Malaysia that has a lot of baggage uh, colonial history uh, interracial conflicts this this become like a like a like a shadow in the society um, and often the, the 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 reaction that you know regulators even some friends in in human rights circle in malaysia tend to think about okay we need to you know shut people shut people down we need to have you know better framework about uh censorship or even within uh media organizations they 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 they're a bit more conservative not because the government tell them but because of their kind of conditioning to um limit expression any response to any of these things or agreement disagreement uh uh Okay. Maybe 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 you all disagree with me after this. Cuz I I saw one walk out so maybe he disagree. <laughs> so another thing I have encountered in kind of doing this work is a number of terms that I find really really unhelpful. So maybe you have more, right? You have more that you can contribute to the list. Um because these are the top 3 that that are the 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 bane to my existence. So like in in Malaysia we always use this term fake news. I'm a bit old school in a way that I don't think like if it's news it shouldn't be fake. If it's like fake maybe it's a, we call it satire or something else, right? It's not news. News is news. News can't be fake, right? Um so so this 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 term is very oxymoronic. It's like um what what's that woman Kellyan Conway like she called alternative facts. like that's that's insane another term that people always use in malaysia like if you work in kind of digital marketing or you talk to like you know people work in in uh communications in campaigns publicity they always stress on the importance of making things viral something has you know this social post has to go viral i want this video to go viral i want this campaign to go viral 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 is a very unhelpful term because we are thinking we're using a, a medical term for something that is not medical at all and and the way because if you're a virologist you probably think about you know infectivity rate you will talk about viral load you could talk about you know 
cell count, whatever. I'm just blabbing. But, but you, do, you can't apply the same kind of concepts in, when you talk about misinformation. Or if you talk about um, in, information in general, information infrastructure or whatever, uh, ecosystem, right? Like it, it doesn't apply, but we tend to use this word because it's catchy, it's, it sounds cool, it's, it's the, the jargon du jour right now. Like a, if, if, if I want to get my campaign stand out to the clients, I would say, okay, this will go viral, right? But it's really unhelpful. And, and I see this as well in like uh, the fact-checking reviews that some of the organizations I mentioned earlier did. So they would have a headline, uh, something, something that went viral two months ago has resurfaced. What do you mean viral two months ago, right? Like, I think that's, that's not a very helpful term. Um, another term that, this is not really a problem, but I think kind of the impact of the term is problematic. Uh, I can't remember what's the name of the man who, who coined this term. So, m malinformation, right? So the idea is, there's this malicious intent in the misinformation. My problem with it is not so much with the framing, but more about the emphasis. When, when we tend to talk about moral information more than, than the harm that misinformation does, we, we're going to stress, go back to the, the idea that I mentioned earlier about you know, shutting people down, right? So, so because this person saying something that is most likely to be untrue, they have the uh, malicious intent to cause harm to the society. So we must send him to jail, right? So, so this, this knee-jerk reaction again is the problem. And, and when, when we, when off, like, I think the origin of the term is more academic, kind of describing a symptom or, 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 or a phenomenon but then when I meet with lawmakers, when I meet with um, regulators, people in, in government, people who make policies, they, they tend to use this word and then the immediate sentence that follow would be things to do with, okay, we need more laws, we need stronger laws, we need to reinforce you know, uh, this law, that law. Um, because people who, who spread misinformation, the spread of misinformation always, always, always by default has malicious intent, uh, which is not true, I, I, I would argue. Because if you go back to my earlier um, thesis, it's, it's normal, right? it's, it's the norm. Um, what is not normal is to always um, assume everything that people around us say is the truth, right? So the, the default of, of our being is actually to question, right? To, to be a bit skeptical uh, when, when we hear, new, when we receive new information, new idea. Um, anyone else have any other unhelpful term that they have encountered? Do you have any that you've encountered in Kofax work? No, no, okay, okay, cool, cool, cool. Uh, what is next? I actually forgot what I put next. Oh, shit. Oh, oh God. It's going to haywire. Okay, so it, it's, it basically says misinformation is not cyclical. So the point I'm trying to make is we often think about misinformation uh, as a cycle. There's a start and then there's an end, and then the new thing will come up and there's start and end again. It will peak somewhere and then it will go down. Um, I, I think we do this because a lot of the times you think about misinformation in terms of news cycle, right? So if you look at, you know, what, what in one week news cycle, there's probably, you know, two, three, four top news stories that would basically um, dominate the, the, the time, what people are talking about. Uh, and then the, the week after that, there'll be a new story and then people forget about what's the story from the previous week, right? So if, if this week we're talking about, um, you know, Gaza conflict. We forget about the Myanmar conflict from you know last year, and then maybe next year there'll be a whole new different conflict. You know, I don't know, uh, Thailand or Vietnam or whatever. Uh, 
So, so the, way, the way we think about misinformation, I, I notice follow that kind of trend also. And then that's why in, in the fact-checking reviews that I see, they would have reviews that, oh, previously viral uh, mis uh, story resurfaced. So, so they basically look at the way the misinformation happened in, in, in cycles again. But what I think misinformation happened, the way misinformation happened, is in, in spirals, right? There's different, different spirals of misinformation. So the, if, if you look at this as more 2D, like think about this spiral would be like 3D, right? It will, and then one spiral can open another spiral and then it will start from somewhere in the middle and then it will start another spiral. So for example, if you take COVID, for example, like you know, someone will start with the IVM, the ivermectin, and then from that, you know, someone will start another, uh, another misinformation about another related drug, and then how you're supposed to use this drug, and then someone from that same thread. So, so I think the crucial part as fact checkers is to trace that spiral, right? Um, essentially about where can we find if we are at this stage of the spiral, can we trace it back upwards and see where it could come from and then where could this spiral come from again? And that is helpful in terms of really kind of um, understand the, 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 the genesis of, of the, the different uh, misinformation that happened within a population. Um, and of course, we need better tools to untangle all these spirals, right? If you think about just within the COVID spiral mess alone, I think it will look more like that than this, right? Because there's just so many things going on. And then, you know, Dr. Fauci keeps saying, oh, the science is evolving, the science is evolving. Okay, yeah, then what? So, and people still want to ask questions, you know, um, about COVID, about vaccines, and then there'll be misinformation about, you know, about 5G vaccines, about, you know, whatever, also Sinovac vaccines, all sorts. So what, what I envision a better tool would be um, are all these things, right? So like I mentioned earlier, we need a tool that enable um, journalists, media organizations, fact checkers, fact checking teams to break their silos, to work together more, to share their tips with each other, share data. Uh, whatever findings that they have, they should share with each other. And the tool should be simple enough that it could be used by anyone. So I've, I've actually interned in, I've actually worked in the media for a bit and interned at Malaysia Kini. Um, and then recently I went back to Malaysia Kini to do a training on um, freedom of expression with, with their young journalists. And what I found out was that they're not very sophisticated when it comes to the human rights language. Like we're, they're not talking about freedom of expression like, like maybe some of us do when we talk about freedom of expression, the right to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas in any medium, uh, any form, right? They, they don't probably speak in that language, but they are the ones who, on the day-to-day -day basis, would, would encounter you know, the, 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 the violations of, of their rights. Um, and they just don't have the capacity to kind of like, you know, um, kind of contemplate all these ideas on their own. So I think when we want to come up with, an, uh, with a tool for, for addressing misinformation, it needs to be something unsophisticated, something so simple that I don't have to think about how to use this thing. And then the terms that I use are, straightforward, right? And, and the straightforwardness means that, you know, I don't have to go read entire, you know, 500 pages of documentation or, you know, go through a three-day workshop training just to use a simple fact-checking tool, right? So, so, so that, that is a must, I feel. And then scalable, replicable, pluggable, extendable. So I, I think this, this was the learning that I had, the realization that I had when I started working on, so the, the initial chatbot was some, uh, a, a kind of a personal project I, I did over Christmas break. And then I realized, oh my God, this is, this is fun because you're building a chatbot. And then I realized 
but this is not scalable, right? I, I can't, if I just to run this on my own, it's not going to be able to be uh, useful for the community. So what I thought was then, what would be the better way of doing this? Perhaps, you know, open it up, you know, open, open source, make it, you know, as a self-hosting -host tool. Um, something that people can just, you know, take and then host themselves and, you know, run with it, right? You know, put in their, their WhatsApp channel, put in their um, SMS system. Um, and then the other kind of requirement would be localizing, contextualizing. Like I mentioned earlier, the, the thing with Malaysia is like um, a few other countries in the region as well. We're not, we're not a monolith, right? The way, even within one ethnic group, like within the Chinese community, within the Malay community, there are different, different segments. Um, we we're often think in, in Malaysia that there's just Malay, Chinese, and Indian. But there are actually more segmentation within those three groups. And then there's also like people from Borneo, which, which you know, people often forget. So there needs to be a way of contextualizing the different tools, in, whether through localization, whether through you know, even you know, tweaking the, the terminologies being used, uh, or even the, the process flow to fit the, the local context or the, the newsroom or the fact-checking teams. So what I've devised is this little framework called Funnel Loop. Um, so the, the, the name itself, like probably like, you know, not, not very clever, like not very sophisticated. So the funnel part is basically all these things, right? The catch and batch, the receive and sieve, the ingest and digest, the collect and connect. So the funnel is all about sorting the information that the system receives, right? Um, the sorting, the grouping, the categorizing, the tagging. And then the loop part would be about, you know, send back the feed, feed, the, feed, feed it back to the, uh, the end user. In, in, in our case, probably you know, someone who probably sent us a tip uh, on WhatsApp or on uh, SMS or on, on, online, uh, on Signal, and then you know, loop, loop it back to them, right? So, so that's, that's the idea of funnel loop. So, so there's a bit that, that do the, the sorting, and then there's a bit that do the communicating. Um, and when we talk about management system, we're essentially talking about managing resources, right? So the resources within uh, Final Loop are these six things. So it took me forever to come up with this, the simplest way to explain these things. So tips, I think like if you work in the media, probably you have a bit of an idea of what tips are. So tips are basically what your readers send you, right? So let's say, I saw, oh, there is a, the, the, there's fire here, and then you know, 10 people died. I write to my local uh, newspaper, hey, I saw this, here is a picture, so I sent a tip, for example. Um, channels are basically the different channels that people can use to, to send those tips, right? So, so in, in, in Malaysia's case, the, the, the most uh, dominant channel, the most Kind of most used channel is probably uh, WhatsApp. And then reviews are basically the actual fact-checking work, the output that uh, fact-checkers make. So, uh, the, so it's the reviews of, of claims, right? So, and claims are basically uh, statements that may contain misinformation. So someone claim, oh, I, this, vaccine contains a 5G chip, right? So that's, that's the claim. And then the review would claim, would, would, sorry, would check on that claim. And then I had, a, I, I don't know what happened. I started thinking about, okay, can we make this a bit more complicated? So let's introduce, you know, all these other concepts that now I'm struggling to explain. So one is info tags. This is probably a very bad name. I don't know how to. Um, what if what if you can think of a better name to call this thing, this resource? Uh, let me know. So the idea of infotech is to basically help with the sorting earlier. So 
Remember this part, the catch and battery receive and receive, and just die, just collect, connect. So InfoTech is basically the, 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 the connector or the, the thing that connects between different, different stories, right? So the idea is using the InfoTech, if I receive 10 different stories, I can see, uh, I, if I receive 10 different tips, I can see, okay, this tip is related to this tip, related to that tip, and then this one is not related, the other one is not related. And the way that it works is that by tagging uh, links, one that I could do easily is links, and then also photos, videos, media files, basically. So the way we do it, just basically re get the machine to read up the file, and then uh, create a token, tokenize the file, so that when it occur again, we can tag it. The same file happens again and again and again. And the idea is, for the reviewers, they can see, okay, if I'm seeing that this InfoTech is repairing, maybe this is what I need to prioritize first, in terms of my fact-checking work. Um, if, you know, if someone is receiving, you know, something uh, that is, you know, have, have Certain, so maybe the content of the tip itself might be different, but the, um, the little, little links and the little, little images are the same, right? And then segments is basically a way of organizing the audience. Um, how I envision it to work is essentially, kind of if, if you think about the, the process flow, the end user sends a tip, uh, to WhatsApp and then forward it to the management system using webhook and then it will automatically organize those tips, you know, infotech, all that, and then fact checker would still need to review manually. I think it's important to have manual review in this instance because a lot of the times um, there are challenges in terms of what the content uh, might be and then it loops back by sending a reply, prepare a note to reply and send it back to the user. Um, and another thing that kind of the, the vision is also to, to kind of popularize claim review. I think like people who, who work in this space know what claim review is. So it's basically a, a what do you call it? A property or an item in, in schema.org. Basically just give meaning to you know, a web page uh, so that you know, web crawlers can properly categorize these things. So all those meet, uh, fact checking teams that I mentioned earlier, except for AFP, none of them actually use claim review. So that's, that's the problem, right? Uh, they do the valuable work of reviewing uh, misinformation, but they don't mark up their articles, fact checking articles properly, and then you know, the, the, it's not really usable when, when people went and search them. So, I'm hoping to incorporate this in, in the final loop as well. And the problem is I had, initially I was just building this in a kind of like this scrappy script um, on Node.js. And then I realized that it's not replicable. So I thought, you know, what would be easy to do WordPress? Because, you know, if, if I just create a plugin, anyone can just plug it in, run their own WordPress, and then play around with it, customize it, um, translate it, whatever, right? So, and the good thing about WordPress, it, it's so, it has already all the different, different hooks and filters and actions that, that you can use. And right out of the box, you have you know, the user management system, the localization framework. Um, and I think the main thing was the active community that WordPress has. So every year, just, just this year actually, uh, the WordCamp Asia was, was in Taiwan. So that, that's really helpful to have um, in terms of thinking how, where I want to root this tool in, right? Um, and the talk earlier also quite inspiring. I need to also think about accessibility um, as well. And I'm not so sure if WordPress um, is the right tool uh, for that. And then the not so good thing was probably, you know, WordPress is a bit bloated. Like my last canvas, there were about 3,000, you know, defined functions. And like, you know, out of 3,000, probably going to use like 100 at most, right? So this is a bit, you know, not, not very useful. Um, and also like in terms of security, also there's a bit of an issue. And because it's, it's PHP, edge computing is not really possible. So like I can't do like, you know, WordPress, uh, the, the whole plugin 
in a serverless um, 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 setup. Um, but, but I still think WordPress is the right fit if I go back to my earlier criteria. So to, to create tools that are collaborative, simple, replicable, extendable, contextualizing all that. Um, simply because the framework is already there, you just need to kind of uh, reorganize things. Um, so, basically where I'm going with this is the, the ideal use case would be there, there should be a consortium of fact checkers and journalists and then the different, the different groups or the different fact checking groups, uh, teams would maintain their own channels and so that you know, they can run their own WhatsApp accounts, they can run their own email signal, whatever, but they can share the tips or the, the raw data that they um, collect together. So there, there'll be one single funnel loop channel, but then multiple different different publications that do that publish the uh, articles. I'm just going to zoom through because we're out of time. And then the another ideal use case would be to automate more with machine learning, because like I mentioned earlier, in the context of Malaysia, there's so many languages, and people often don't text in you know standard English or Malay or Chinese. There's colloquialism a lot um, imbued in, in our daily communications. It's difficult. But there are also limitations that we have to overcome in terms of safety, in terms of privacy. I think that the, my big hurdle now is probably the documentation. I realized that I should have done the documentation first, the specs first before I built the tool. Um, so, so, so I'm starting looking at this now also and also getting the buy-in from the different um, groups in Malaysia because like, you know, if you work with, with Mal Malaysian you know, CSO people, we can sometimes be a bit territorial with, with our work. And that's why there's an upside-down bus. Um, I don't think we have the time for demo, but uh, if you want to check it out, I haven't released it yet. I was hoping to kind of just play it around with it later. But if you want to check it out, um, maybe just don't text me on that because that's the, the, the number to go to the funnel loop. But you can reach me at this, on this uh, email or, or website or matrix. So I really hope like, you know, I can like, connect with other people after this, maybe like, you know, even tomorrow um, if, if, you know, if you are here and you remember me tomorrow or later and come up to me and, and you know, share your thoughts and ideas. Um, thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you Kai for your presentation. And I have to say personally, I'm a big fan of your presentation decks. Aesthetic, <laughs> that's a Gen Z. I'm really like into this kind of like graphic design, like lots of memes, but there's, I believe there's um, some of the people they sh like post their question on the Slido, so maybe I think we can have for a few minutes to for you to answer them. So let me like open that up real quick. And uh, wait a sec. So for people who doesn't know where to like um, drop your question to the speaker, you can go to our website and there's a collaboration notes and you can like um, slide it to the bottom and you can see our room is R2 and there's our session right over here. And a lot of good people, they drop their own notes to this following session and you can find the online oh. question and answer link and get inside. And there you have it. And let's see. So Kai, can you like answer some of them? And for the people in this room, your uh, microphone actually can be used this in front of you and you can press the button and after the red light, Link, you can like speak in through the microphone. So Kai, the floor yeah. is yours. So the, the, the first question is yes. 
So from my experience, like in the, at least at, in Malaysia Kini, where the different language desks actually sit, sit in the same room. So we have the Chinese desk, the English desk, and the Malay desk, all sitting in the same room, in the same floor. They're still kind of segregated, like there's Chinese cluster there, Malay will cluster here, and then the English desk will cluster here. So the ones who would kind of like go over are those, those journalists who write in multiple languages. So back then in Malaysia Kini, at least we would have like more senior um, journalists who write in both English and Chinese, for example, or Malay and English. Uh, they, they tend to be a bit more versatile when it comes to um, collaborating. So now if you look at outside of one organization, you look at, for example, you know, the, the, the big conglomerate here and then with this other big conglomerate, they even don't talk to each other. They probably socialize and like you know, they meet at you know, press conference and all that, but they don't actually have time to actually talk about these things. So the, 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 the workshop that birthed this idea was actually around last year, around April, May last year. Um, Internews actually brought together a bunch of um, journalists, media practitioners to KL from Indonesia, from, from Malaysia. And that's where I first learned about Kofax because TT Cat was sharing about Kofax there. Um, and we just got excited because we thought, oh, let's do something like this in Malaysia. And, but the problem was that group is all English speaking um, journalists. Like we don't have you know, people who from the Chinese media, or from the Malay media. So that kind of fragmentation in our society is also reflected in our media, unfortunately. Using AI, I actually do not know like... Well, uh, maybe, maybe we can have this kind of like yeah. conversation after this session. Sure. So maybe we can pick a more... Any other one? Like um, question for the smaller scale. Like um, this one is more like... A, like um, I don't want to like evoke a political debate right over here, so, so maybe we can start from this one. And after this one, we uh, can like, so, yeah. Uh, oh wait, I, d I didn't have my code in there. So basically, it's, it's a hash. Uh, there's a script within that WordPress plugin that will open the link. And then, oh sorry, the link would be just the actual link will be hashed. So from the you know, HTTPS, whatever, whatever, to the query, right? It will be hashed. And then I also take an excerpt, like I will take you know, parts of the link of the URL and it's hashed. So I, I'm not sure if people know what's a hash. Yeah, we're familiar, right? Okay, so I don't have to explain. And then with images, it's basically, so when people send images to the uh, WhatsApp, to the funnel loop, the script will just open that image, read it, and then hash the entire content. So initially, I used MD5 because that's you know easy and fast. Um, but I'm thinking like maybe there are other you know more efficient. Because the reason I use MD5 is because it's not really a security um, hashing. It's more of a um, pattern matching, right? So we need something quick and simple that will not use a lot of um, compute power. So. For now, use MD5 to basically look at you know, the different contents of files, hash. The reason, the reason I was thinking about doing this was because I realized when talking to one of the people who are doing uh, fact checking, like actually checking the WhatsApp, they get sent like all sorts of nasty uh, content. Like sometimes it's like, you know, like explicit content or doxing. So it's, it's actually harmful, right? So I was thinking if you can add an extra layer to that, you know, at least create a barrier that, okay, before you open this file, know that, okay, this file has been flagged up, that it contains whatever, whatever, whatever. And then similar file will happen. Um, the limitation of InfoTech, for example, maybe because, because the, if the file get cropped, for example, or the file get compressed um, by the tool, uh, the infotech will not work as well. So if you have ideas about how we can generate you know, from the pixel rather than from the, 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 the binary content of the file, I think that, that would be a cool way of doing it. I, I know the technology is out there because um, Facebook has something similar when they used to ch basically check non-consensual 
intimate images uh, shared on, on Facebook. So they basically tokenize those images. You can upload, like, you know, if, if you're a survivor of uh, revenge porn, for example, another unhelpful term, uh, revenge porn, you can upload the picture in question. Facebook don't save the actual picture, they will just save a tokenized version of that picture. And then when it sees similar type of um, picture appearing, the tokenized version of that picture appearing, it will take it down, right? So the, the technology is out there, but when I research about it, like the compute power that it takes, like I cannot run a WordPress on a shared hosting and then run this m massive you know, image scanning tool. It's a bit difficult. Okay. So um, is there anyone in, the, in this room want to like, speak directly with your microphone? Um, let's uh, for final question for mm. you for easier <laughs> to answer I guess I don't know because like there's no people voting for each other's question um, which one you prefer to answer I don't, I'm actually curious the one for fi 50 what, what is that oh got it so basically it's just like um some of the people um thinking the ruling parties they like paying to um like um some of the company trying to like control the ah, speech okay. environment. Yeah. We have similar uh in, in Malaysia we call oh my god, what what do you call it? Cyber troopers. So they are basically paid uh like, you know, uh propaganda propaganda machine for, for hire. Um I guess similar to what you have and then in Indonesia, they have something similar. There's, it's, we call cyber troopers. What do you call? Something similar. I can't remember. Yeah. Cool. Cool. So, do you want to like have the final one? You specific, specifically like interested to? Oh, uh, maybe I can just share about Zoom check. So, so Zoom check, uh, kind of, they they basically supported by GNI Google News Initiative. Uh, the kind of the first phase at least, I'm not sure if they're still funded by Google. Um, the idea was to basically bring together the different uh, fact-checking teams in Malaysia under one roof and start strategizing. And they did a bit of that, um, but now I think what happened is because there's not really clear leadership or clear direction of how they work, it kind of died down. So what they do is they just basically reshare, repost, um, the work that the, the different uh, media entities did. I know before they did a bit more sharing, they had like a spreadsheet uh, that they share within the, the, the six founding members of Jumcheck. Uh, and then they did uh, fact checking around the election as well. So I know it, it can happen and it also relates to the other question about you know, sharing tips. So just basing on, on the, 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 the collaboration within Jomcheck, even at that small scale, I was thinking, you know, and this is just English, mainly English, uh, English media organization, English language media organizations. Uh, we haven't even included like the Chinese presses because in Malaysia, the English, English press is actually quite small. The, the main ones are actually the Chinese press and the Malay press, the me well, media organizations. Um, because they have bigger readership, they have bigger teams, uh, well-resourced. And my hope is to actually get those kind of groups buy-in first, because they would be the one who would have, you know, the, 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 the most resources in terms of uh, building this consortium that I'm dreaming about. Cool. So, um, like, it's the very valuable experience from Malaysia and the incredible works from Engage Media. So let's give like Kai for another round of applause. Thank you, Thank Kai, you so for much. your yeah, presentation. Thank you.